Um, so we're going to have someone come up to talk about redeeming Christmas, continu continuing with the redeeming culture. Um, so y'all know this next talker is Natasha. Okay, you guys know Natasha. She brings the fire. So Natasha graduated from Autobahn in 2015. Uh, she is. <laughs> Um, she is the third of six children, and I hope none of you take offense to this, but she despises yeah, Hallmark movies. Okay, give it up for Natasha. <laughs> Thanks. Can everybody? Oh, you can hear me very well. Okay, so. Um, you guys clearly see why I was involved with Gossip Pride. I cannot sing, so do not ask me to. I just love Jesus and I love Mr. Joyce, so you clearly see why. But for me, I am so hyped. I've been hyped ever since like we talked about having a Christmas theme um, night, just because Christmas is my favorite time of the year. Um, it lights are covered. Uh, lights cover windows like shining drops of candy, and houses are decorated with delicate care. People feel an unexplainable, explainable amount of generosity in their spirit and. Love literally fills the air. It's like magic. I love it. Plus, it's my birthday month too, whatever, in like a day. And so I used to get double presents and the double parties. It was, like, it was like, happy birthday, Jesus. Happy birthday, Tasha. It was great. You know, so I love it. But I know some of you guys in this room may be thinking like, okay, that's not me. I didn't grow up having the best um, Christmases or maybe you lost somebody during this time. It's just really difficult. Or maybe you're one of those Christians who is so tired of the commercialism and how like we're thankful one minute then Black Friday the next and all that good stuff. And you're just like, I just don't like Christmas. And so I completely and totally understand the different perspectives that come around this time of the year. It's, it's, um, a, it's a very emotional time. But what I want us to do tonight is to think about what would it look like for us to kind of take it off of ourselves, so off of, the, off of the birthday month, off of the experiences you had, whether they were good or bad, um, off of even the commercialism and think, okay, how do we as Christians worship Jesus in this time? How do we give our all in this time? What does God want us to do? And so that begins, obviously, with knowing the Christmas story. And so again, I know some of you guys, maybe you, like half you guys know this story, you've heard since you were like little, and other people are like, okay, I never really actually knew this story. No, Santa is not in it, I'm sorry, it's not in the Bible at all. But the fun thing is that um, the, the one of the reasons we're doing the Christmas story is not just because it's Christmas season, but the fact that we cannot get to the cross without getting to the manger. Right. Okay, we cannot get our salvation without having Christ come in the beginning. And so I love this story. We're gonna look at three different things um, that come with what it, what it should look like for Christians to worship in this time, What how are we supposed to um, have this time. But first we're gonna open up in prayer and then we're just gonna let God speak, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, I just praise you and thank you so much just for your spirit being here, God. Your word says where two or more are gathered, there you are with us. And so we praise you that you're with us, God. And we ask that you just speak through me and speak to me and everyone else, Lord, to help us really understand what it looks like to worship you and be in awe of you in this season to share the gospel and to let other people know about you that um so just speak through me and just yeah thank you so much for this time and Christ we pray amen. amen okay so we're going to talk about three different things but first i want to bring up two people max and lily they're going to be my readers for tonight so max and lily could you guys come up here give them a round of applause you guys <laughs> So last minute, last night, like, hey, you guys want to read? And they said, yeah. Okay, so this is great. So you guys go ahead and just grab a mic. Wait, is this the order? Yes, it is yeah. the order. <laughs> yes, Luke. We're going to look at Luke um, 1, 26 through 28. And clearly, y'all see I got people of color for, for the uh, manger, because that's, yeah, that's how it works. Let's be real. Okay, so the question, how should we as Christians live out this Christmas season? And so we're going to start off with Mary. Mary is my home girl. She is a beast. And I'm going to explain that in a second. Okay, we'll explain how she has extraordinary faith. But first, we're going to have Mary and Gabriel read to us. <laughs> in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The, virgin, the virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will, be con uh, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am only a virgin. 
The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. Mm -hmm. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your, wor your, word, be to <laughs> May your word to me be fulfilled. Okay, so let me back in a little bit. Okay, so I know um, there's a lot of times when we look at these biblical characters and we see them as just that. We see them as characters, but we forget that they're actually people, just like us. They were flesh and blood who decided to follow God and take him up on his word. And that is one of, re one of the reasons that I absolutely love Mary. She did just that. And so Mary was not a special girl in the eyes of man. So, and we know this just because from scripture, there's a lot of times when they say that um, they know when someone is beautiful, when someone's extremely intelligent, when someone's extremely athletic, it's said. But for Mary, there was nothing specific that was said in that time. So we have to um, assume that there was nothing outwardly special about her. But the boss part about her is that this scripture right here says that she was highly favored by God. Mary loved the Lord. We know this because of her willingness to submit to the angel's authority, knowing that it came straight from God. And later, when she goes on, like in ten, um, she goes on with ten verses of praise that we're not going to read tonight. Um, she's like praising God. You cannot praise a God that you don't know. And so we have to know that even Mary, at a young age, she knew Christ. So she was an ordinary girl who God used to be the mother of our Savior. Y'all, that's dope. Okay. <laughs> but choosing to say yes to God came with a risk. So she was 15, about 15 or 16 years old is what we um, guesstimate. And I know that sounds a little weird because she was pledged to be married, but at that time period when you, you would begin to um, get married around 12 years old. And so um, for her to uh, be engaged to someone, it wasn't just like, oh, okay, we're engaged one day, up, oh, I don't like you, no, we're engaged no more. It's not like how it is nowadays, okay? <laughs> it's, no, like when you were engaged, they would call it betrothal, I think that's the right way to say it, but it would last for about a year. And what happens is that if you were seen, like if you were guys engaged, like that was it. The people would see you as if you were married. And so for her to go to Joseph and say, hey, by the way, I'm pregnant. It's not yours. It's the Holy Spirit. It's like, that just wasn't going to fly. That just was not good. And so one already sounds weird. You guys are laughing like, yeah, it sounds goofy. But in that time period, she could have been killed. It wasn't just like, oh, okay, like, well, that sucks or whatever. We're going to figure this out. No, it's like she could have, he had the... Um, he had the law on his side. He could have stoned her, and everyone would have been okay with it because adultery was that serious. Still is, but we won't kill her by them. Either way. <laughs> um, so all she wanted, but the crazy thing here is all she wanted to know, she wasn't asking God, like, okay, are you going to tell my parents? Are you going to tell my fiance? This is that. She said, no, like, how is this going to happen? That's the only question that she asked. Now, if that was me, let me tell y'all, okay, y'all have not been my father, all right? <laughs> that wouldn't have worked, okay? You, he, yes, okay, no choice knows. He don't play like that, all right? He'd be like, who's the daddy? Holy Spirit, please. Like, it wouldn't have worked that way. But, <laughs> but, and so, yeah, so, but Mary wasn't like that at all. She was a woman of faith. And so, when she decided to say yes to Jesus, she was not only saying um, she was knowing that her life is on the line. She chose pregnancy over protection. She chose to follow Jesus over her marriage. And that's a big deal, too, because, again, women, I know, we're all about our independence and things like that, living on our own, all that good stuff, whatever. But in that time period, if you were not married and if you didn't have a covering over you, if you did not have anything, like especially as a single mom that they let you live, you were basically seen as, as a widow. And the widows, anytime the widows are said in the Bible, people did not take care of them. God is always saying, take care of the widows, take, take care of the widows, because no one took care of them. So she would have been poor. So she, her whole livelihood, everything about her would have been destroyed, all, all if she said yes to Jesus, all, excuse me, all if she said yes to the angel, and she said yes. Like, that's crazy. So what can we learn from Mary? We learn that having faith in something and then believing in something sometimes can be two different things. In the words of my shiro, Priscilla Shire, um, faith is acting like God is telling the truth. And so it's not just this idea that, okay, um, yeah, I, I believe that, you know, I believe in God, and that's great. It's like, okay, no, if I believe that what God is telling me is true, that means I'm going to say yes when he calls me to go give money to, to this homeless person, when he calls me to share the gospel with my teammate. That's faith. That is acting in faith. Well, but we, what we like to do is, as people, we like to say, oh, I have so much faith, and this, this, and that. And it's like, no, it's not, faith cannot be, um, not, can, cannot be guesstimated in like how much you will know and how much you um, think about whatever. Faith is shown by what you do. 
And so if you really believe it, you um, show what you believe by the way that you act. And so that's what uh, Mary did for us. And so a lot of times we say our faith needs to be bigger and that our faith, um, but that's not true. Our, it, it is that our perspective of God needs to be bigger. Mary saw God as a God who could not only protect her life, but who could create a child out of nothing. Y'all, she was a virgin. Like, what the crap? Like, that's crazy, okay? <laughs> Mary the Virgin ain't got nothing on that. What's it, what's it, what's that show called? Is it Mary the Virgin? Jane the Virgin, whatever her name is. See, she ain't got nothing on that. This like, legit happened. That's crazy. But Mary believed that not only could um, God create a baby out of nothing, but that God could provide for her and love her and be there for her. So she said yes. That was her step of faith. And so there was a census that was being taken in the town. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot to tell this part. So Joseph, he was kind of freaking out about that. He was like, okay, I'm not going to have you stoned or anything like that, but this is not my child. I don't understand. And it wasn't until um, an angel came to him in the dream that he said that he was able to confirm everything that Mary said. So they got married. Um, but then they had to take a census. Uh, they had to do a census. So they had to go back to Bethlehem. And that is where Jesus was born. He was not born in like a fancy place. I know he's, we call him King of Kings and Lord of Lords because that's what he is. But being that, being the humble Lord of Lords that he is, he was born in a manger. He was born, and we keep saying, we always say a barn, like we have that like little picture and stuff. But in that time period, it would have looked more like a cave. And so, I don't know if y'all ever seen a birth. Okay. <laughs> it's beautiful, and it's not. Like, it's kind of crazy. And then, I'm not a person that likes animals. I know a lot of you guys do. But that combination, birth and animal, that just don't mix with me. That, just, <laughs> that wouldn't go well. But that is how Jesus chose to come into this world, like in the most humble way possible. I'm sorry for that image, y'all, but we just had to be real for a second. And so um, he was born, yeah, so he was born in the most humble way. So can I have my readers back up here? Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. You guys, keep cheering for them. They're doing great, guys. <laughs> so now we're going to read about um, Luke 2, sorry, Luke 2, 8 through 20. So we just read about Mary's extraordinary faith, and now we're going to read about the shepherds, their intentional, joyful evangelists. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had told what had been told to them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered, pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, <clears throat> glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Thank you, guys. Um, one thing I want to point out here, and the girls I disciple know I always kind of just stop and really point out things that I love. Um, but I feel like God really showed me this. And so the part that says, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. I love that part. Because I think a lot of times when we think of God, we just think of like, oh, you know, like <laughs> this angelic kind of weird thing, whatever. But they said um, that they said they were terrified. And it wasn't, wasn't even um, necessarily God. It was just his glory. Mm -hmm. And so um, that is the God that we serve, that even a glimpse of his majesty would bring us to our knees and make us realize how small and feeble we are as humans. This is a room of, well, we don't just have athletes here. We have people from all walks of life. But specifically for athletes, we can feel like we just suck. Like, yes, like, have you seen the game I played the other day? Have you seen me swim? Like, I'm a beast on the, what's the gymnastics? I always, try, I always get that stuff wrong. What's the little, the rings? Is that what it is? Yeah? Yeah, on the rings. Okay, great. <laughs> have you seen me on the rings? Like, I killed it. But, like, when it comes to standing in God's glory, just being in his presence, we're terrified. It humbles us back to our knees and to think that, okay, I am not as big as I think. I, I need a savior. I love that part. So the, the shepherds were doing what they do. They were watching over their flock when the angels came and changed their lives forever. Heaven literally came down to earth to praise God, and they got to witness all of it. 
So what did they do after, after all of it? They ran and they joyfully told others. They were eyewitnesses from seeing the heavenly host of angels to seeing baby Jesus the night that he was born. This is the definition of a testimony. Now, for some, some of you guys who are athletes and actually you guys know this, for you guys who don't know, we always do like a one minute or like a five minute testimony. We like, we talk about, oh, my Bible study is doing great or oh, God did this in my life and this is how I got saved. And that's fantastic. But a lot of times we love to keep that into our Christian bubbles. We, love, we don't like to share with other people. You guys, in a couple of weeks, y'all about to be home. And some of y'all are actually going to stay here. So what, is, what does it look like for you to tell your family your faith story? Who is on your team that doesn't know Christ, that needs to know Christ? Who, which one of your coaches that you've never had a spiritual conversation with? Why do you live the way that you do? There's got to be questions. We can't just go by and just act like, oh my gosh, like, yeah, God saved my soul, but I won't tell anyone. What is that? God did not send his only son to die for the world just so that you can keep it a secret or so that you can have, um, you can not offend anyone. Y'all, this is all about Jesus. This is, there's only two times of the year that Christians are allowed to say, Jesus, 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 okay? And it's what? Christmas and what? Easter. Easter. Okay, so let's stop complaining about how, like, oh, my family only comes on Christmas or Easter. Great! Share the gospel with them. Bring them to the place. And afterwards, have spiritual conversations. That's what evangelism means. It means to share the gospel. It means to tell people about who Jesus is, why he has changed your life. And that's what the shepherds did. The shepherds were nobody. Again, the shepherds were not these big, amazing people. Like, they were just seen, again, on the, the bottom of the totem pole. But as soon as they, they got to experience all these amazing things, and they didn't keep it to themselves. They ran back and told everyone. That's awesome. Okay, so the recap story a little bit. So um, Angel comes to Mary. Oh, you're going to be pregnant. She's like, okay. Then she tells Joseph. Joseph freaks out. And then, um, but the angel comes to Joseph, and they get married. And then they end up going to Bethlehem, and they have the baby. And the shepherds come. They get all excited. They praise them, and they go share the gospel. Okay, so next, we're going to talk about the Magi and the little drummer boy. And for those of you who are already upset about the drummer boy, hush, I will explain it in a second. But can I have my um, readers one more time? You guys are doing fantastic. One more round of applause. After they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. They, then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Awesome. Thank you. So um, some of you guys may know this, but the Magi, they're also called the wise men. They're actually, I know that we love to say that there were three of them, but we actually are not exactly sure how many there were. We like to say three just because they gave three gifts. But um, they're called wise men um, because they were known for studying the stars, known for astrology. And we also think they're wise as well because since they studied the star, they knew what they were doing. They knew where they were going. So they must have known the Old Testament. They must have known the, the um, different things that were said about Jesus in the past. And so when they saw that specific star, they knew to follow it. Okay, so just keep that in mind. So one um, thing that we always love to talk about is how they were ridiculously generous because they knew who they were giving to. They were giving to a king. And that's the type of gifts they gave, the gold, the incense, the frankincense, and myrrh. They all were the type of things you would give to a king. And this is a baby getting this. Like that's, I don't know, I think it's awesome. Um, so the, from my study Bible, this is what they say that um, the different gifts mean. There might be some differences, but it's okay. Um, the gold was symbolic of Christ's deity, the fact that he was 100% God and 100% man. Okay, so if he was just man, and he died for us. That means he was able to be sinful. Because he was 100% God, he was sinless. He was able to die for us. That's a big, crucial detail. Incense or frankincense represented his purity. And again, so like we needed someone who was completely pure to die for us. And then myrrh represented his death. And, and the reason myrrh represented his death is because um, it was used for embalming. Mm -hmm. And so the thing I want us to get across, like I think we hear a lot about the gifts and everything, and, and that's very important, but I want us to see their total worship. Their immediate reaction to seeing the prophecy fulfilled, to meeting Jesus, even as a child. So at this time, he was a child. They actually came a few years after he was born. To being in the presence of their Savior, grown men, probably old men. They bowed down and worshipped. How often do we bow down and worship God? Like literally bow down on our heads and knees and praise him for what he has done. I know I've done it when I go through hard times. But I don't do anything. God must say, oh, thanks, Jesus. We're good. We'll keep going. Like, no, we need to 
worship him every day. Reading this passage reminds me of a song that we sing in gospel choir. And again, I cannot sing. Okay, so I will be talking off these words. Um, but the song goes, bow down and worship him. Yes. Worship him, oh, worship him. This is holy ground, so come and bow down. How often do we think that when we get into the presence of God, we're on holy ground? How often do we think when we open up scriptures, when we go to church, like when any time that God makes himself known that we're on holy ground and that us, our sinful selves, all of us know the worst things that we've done. And yet he said, no, I'm welcoming you there. That's beautiful. Like, oh, I love that. And that's why he deserves to, um, for us to bow down to him. And so the next thing, okay, the little drummer boy, holy worship. I told, okay, listen. Before I get like kicked off staff, now we know that there was no drum aboard anywhere mentioned in scripture, and there is no historical documents um, that says that he, there was one in existence. So we have to conclude that there was no drum aboard. But at the same time, the wannabe writer in me loves the picture of the drum aboard. At least the, the picture the author was um, portraying when he talked about him. This idea of coming in the presence of Jesus, and like they said that they would have said the story that he became as a baby. Um, when Jesus was a baby, and knowing that right in front of you is the king of kings, but you have nothing to give him. You see his power, you see his majesty, even just from him being that small, but you have nothing. And then you're like, wait, I do have something. I have my drums. Like, don't we teach you guys that all the time? Audience of one, that like, it's not, we don't worship to receive salvation. It is because we have salvation that we worship. And so the idea of the drummer boy of knowing that God gave him everything so he gives it back to God in worship, y'all, come on, that's deep, okay? Like, no, it's not biblical, but it's darn good, okay? <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> and so and that's, why, that's one of the reasons I love the, the drummer boy. So the last example I'm going to give to bring all these three together is talk about my lovely roommate, um, Kate. And so a couple weeks ago, you guys got to meet Kate. She came and talked about her ministry, Harvest, Harvest Bridge, and they work with indigenous pastors in South Asia and who are being persecuted consistently for their faith. And so living with Kate is a lot of adventures. But um, one of the things that I remember she had told me when I first moved in, she um, told me the story about how some of those who were involved in the ministry in South um, Asia spent the entire night one time, they spent the entire night worshiping and fasting, and then that day they decided to go out and share the gospel. It was like a ton of them going out and sharing the gospel. And they were not met with slam doors, they weren't met with like, I don't know, whatever else we're met with over here. They were met with rocks. They were met with stones. And it was, they were thrown by the local guard. So imagine our police throwing stones at us for sharing the gospel. And, but they, and they told them to stop sharing the gospel, but they refused. The next day, those two guards that were the main ones throwing the stones, they came back to that church and accepted Christ. Because our brothers and sisters took extraordinary steps of faith and did intentional evangelism, after spending a night of worshiping God, two more people came to Christ. Y'all, that was their Christmas. And we seriously are arguing over what, a Starbucks cup? Like, <laughs> we're seriously upset that people are putting Xmas. Like, how about we show people what it means to have Christ in Christmas? How about we actually take it upon ourselves and get out of, the, of this, like, oh, I'm only going to do this, this, and that. How about we share the gospel with people? How about we love them into Christ? Like, how about we, and this is the time of the year that everyone is so joyous. Like, let's show them where our joy comes from, why, we're, why we have this joy even through the hard times and the, and the hurt times. You guys, this is the time of the year, like I said, it's an extreme emotional time. Some people are going to be really depressed. They're going to be feeling, feeling very lonely. How can we as believers step into that? to allow God's presence to, in some sense, terrify them, but then terrify them to their knees and accept Christ. Come on, y'all. This is not about us. Christmas is about Christ. So if we take out, like, not saying that the presents are bad or anything like that, like, clearly, we, get, we brought my dang tree. I love the, like, the presents. I love the, everything about this stuff. Like, it's beautiful. But let's not miss what Christmas is about. Our brothers and sisters on the other side of the world, they know how to celebrate Christmas. They know that it's all about Jesus. So they worship and they fast and they share the gospel and they trust God to do, a, a, to do a miraculous things. Again, back to my homegirl, Mary. There was nothing important about her. She just said yes to God. How are you going to say yes to God? Just um, break. And so we have no excuse, you guys. Y'all, people's souls are on the line. We don't have time to be messing around. So 
How should we as Christians live out this Christmas season? Like Mary, with extraordinary faith, like the shepherds with intentional joyful evangelism, and like the magi and the fictional drummer boy with total worship to God. Thanks.